So far as South Africa is concerned, it has not been directly affected by the events, and it is still too early to determine the precise effect of the action taken. But the situation is and remains one which can have distressing consequences. And every further development will have to be carefully evaluated and every step to protect the interests of South Africa and its peoples will have to be taken with calm deliberation. The policy of separate development naturally is the domestic policy of South Africa, but it's, it is not a policy, if I may just say that in passing, it is not a policy designed for export at all. It is a policy designed to meet the situation of South Africa and is consequently uh, devised for South Africa alone. As I've said previously, I am prepared to explain this policy to each and every body who wishes to discuss it with me, and I'll be glad to take the opportunity because it is my confirmed opinion that more nonsense has been written and spoken about this policy than any other subject I know of. If and when I enter into a dialogue with any leader of any country, and it has often happened in the past, I take it for granted that this policy will be discussed. And I will gladly make use of the opportunity to explain the policy for what it is and not for what people say it is. Are there likely to be any visits of any, uh, any African leaders to South Africa? Yes, there will be visits of African leaders to South Africa. There was one last Friday, if you will remember, when Prince Lamini of uh, Swaziland and certain members of his cabinet came to South Africa. There will be more visits in the course of this year, and there will be a state visit by the President of Malawi. It is a truism to say that we live in dangerous and unsettled times. The Indian-Pakistan conflict has suddenly again illustrated this point. It has also unfortunately illustrated the ineffectiveness of the United Nations as an organization to preserve the peace of the world. Ironically, for years these countries counted amongst our main accusers. What has now happened must have been foreseen for years and years. Washington ruled out intervention in Angola with American troops. Instead, it turned secretly to South Africa. South Africa was in a position from isolation. South Africa was isolated. Although it was done secretly, it was good for South Africa to be cooperating with a big force like the USA, even though it was clandestine. A bigger challenge now faced the MPLA. 
In October 1975, South African troops had invaded Angola. From their bases in Namibia, they had joined forces with UNITA. We advanced approximately, I think, on, uh, something like 80 kilometers a day. By this time, my troops were getting good, eh? I mean, they were really getting on with it now. They were out of those vehicles and into uh, assault formations, which shoot the hell out of these people, you see, and then they would back up and move because they didn't expect this. South of Luanda, the Cubans prepare to end the South African advance. It was a decisive battle, because if they broke our defense, it would be very difficult then to stop them getting to Luanda. There were roads going to the north, roads going to the center, many roads, which would have made their advance very powerful and fast. The Cubans were ready, waiting. Angola would have been lost. Mobutu's troops were close to Luanda. The South Africans had penetrated over a thousand kilometers. They were close to Luanda. Not only the Americans were keen to contain the possible Soviet influence in the region. To the south of Angola, apartheid South Africa was eyeing developments with concern. Communism, as far as South Africa was concerned, was a real threat. A threat in the sense of dictating, taking over um, uh, the whole of the country. And we couldn't have that situation here in South Africa, that they could come through and instigate and uh, plant the uh, ideology of Marxism here in Southern Africa. And that meant we're the next target, we're the cherry on the cake. The South African Defense Force decided to move into Angola. There, they immediately found natural allies in the local movements that had been chased out of Luanda by Neto's leftist MPLA. The scheduled date for independence was approaching fast. With U.S. logistical support, the FNLA troops, accompanied by soldiers from Mobutu's regular army, advanced from the north. UNITA soldiers, along with the South African army, moved up from the south. The MPLA, despite receiving consignments of Soviet weapons, suddenly found itself at a disadvantage. It is the grand strategy of the Soviets ultimately to control the southern tip of Africa. Well knowing that if they control the southern tip of Africa, then they not only straddle the Cape Sea route, then not only have they got a terrific advantage in the case of a conventional war, because then they will be controlling Africa, but they can cut the lifeline of Europe, 24,000 ships passing around the Cape, carrying two-thirds of Europe's oil, much of its food and other necessary. But in addition, if they have the minerals of South Africa, together with what they have, then they've got a monopoly in the world of that which the Western world must have. And it is the grand strategy of the communists to subvert not only other countries in Africa, but the southern tip of Africa. I don't know what the so-called Western and free world will do under those circumstances, but I know what South Africans, Afrikaans and English speakers will do, small as we are, and with what we've got, 
We will defend this country to the last man because we will not only... Whereas the time has now come for me, as I've already announced, to vacate the office that I've been holding for the last 12 years. I want to take this opportunity to say thank you, not only to my constituents, not only to the members of my party, but to all South Africans, all South Africans of all language groups, South Africans of all color, for the kindness that they have shown me over the years and for the services they have in fact rendered to me.